Well, I just want to start off by saying thanks to Ryan and Chris for uh, inviting me to talk here today. And I wanted to give a little bit of an update on uh, some soybean pests. And uh, I arrived here in North Dakota about five years ago, and it's been uh, quite an interesting scene to watch kind of the popularity, the boundary of soybeans shift a little bit further west. And when we think about that, uh, that kind of gives us an idea of what to think about for insects. Uh, we can kind of look to our neighbors in the east to what may be um, in the foreground or in the not too distant future. So I want to talk about uh, several times of insects today. Uh, a couple of them, uh, you've probably heard me talk here and there uh, on occasion. I do want to introduce a new midge that's appearing in the soybean belt as well. So uh, we'll get to some of that here in a bit, but I'm first gonna start off with soybean aphid and a insecticide resistance that appears to be taking shape uh, throughout parts of North Dakota. Okay. So soybean aphid uh, actually survives on two different uh, plant host throughout the growing season. It has a winter host and that of a summer host. So that primary host for the winter time is actually a uh, common buckthorn. Uh, the interesting thing about this, it's not too common throughout parts of North Dakota. It's been controlled very well. Um, it's just not really here. Uh, what suggests soybean aphid when it does show up really needs to find a different method to arrive here in North Dakota. And really that is thanks to the upper level wind currents that tend to bring that in. So it tends to be blown in uh, from the mid parts of the Midwest, you know, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, even parts of Minnesota are able to kind of fuel the populations that we see here in North Dakota uh, should they arrive here. In the summertime, of course, it shifts over to that uh, soybean uh, for that summer host. Uh, throughout the soybean belt, soybean aphid is considered one of the uh, most injurious uh, insects to soybean, and really that has to do with its reproductive potential. Uh, you can see here in about a day and a half time, a population can double under uh, idealistic conditions. And if you think about idealistic conditions for soybean aphid, you're going to be about room temperature, about 72 degrees Fahrenheit up to about 75% or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you're going to be looking at relatively moderate humidities, you know, 60%, 70% humidity that will help fuel that. But uh, a day and a half time period under those conditions can really lead to a doubling of that population. The one thing I want to bring up about this map is this is not a map that's showing you when it was discovered in each state. Uh, rather, it's a map just showing a snapshot every four or five years, uh, just kind of showing you the progress. And of course, 2020 is the 20th year that soybean aphid, it's been 20 years since it's been found in the US. Uh, this is a native pest of parts of Southeast Asia. So it's been 20 years now, uh, first being discovered in parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin during the year 2000, and really spreading out from there. Uh, a lot of researchers believe it was likely here before the year 2000, but it was such a low population levels that it probably was under the radar and just kind of went unnoticed. Uh, so you can just kind of see a little bit of that spread by this distribution map uh, throughout the soybean growing regions of the United States. Uh, this does not show uh, some of the Canadian provinces to the north. Uh, however, uh, those provinces as well have been dealing with the impacts of soybean aphid for quite some time. Soybean aphid uh, is kind of an interesting insect uh, compared to most other insects pests. So uh, I talked about the doubling in a day and a half and this really becomes this particular insect can go through sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction and typically sexual reproduction you have the male and the female that typically happens for a short time two times a year and it's really when the hosts are beginning to wrap up. So you see that at the end of the winter time, uh, soybeans are beginning to emerge. So you get that new population uh, from eggs and they move out into some of the soybean fields. Uh, then you kind of lose the wings from some of those generations. Uh, really they go into asexual reproduction or kind of think of cloning if you will, uh, that's taking place. And you'll have that asexual reproduction that takes 
place really into soybeans really begin to mature later in the year. Uh, and then we'll kind of go through this process again. Uh, of course, wind is always going to be a benefit to aphids as they spread. But when you have that kind of asexual reproduction and that ability to turn over generations, you can get high numbers, economic threshold numbers very quickly. High numbers can lead to several different aspects in yield loss. Of course, seed weights uh, will be reduced in high populations of aphids. Uh, when you have a high population, you're gonna probably see uh, lower seed numbers uh, being found in soybean pods, and you're probably gonna see a reduction in the pods being developed per plant. And of course, a connection with the number of nodes being found. And when you bring all that together, you can get a major yield impact. Uh, you're seeing one of the studies here on this chart by uh, Dr. Osley, uh, 2002, showing upwards of 45% reduction uh, from high aphid populations. And we're probably talking populations into the thousands uh, when seeing this type of uh, data response being shown here. One of the big uh, things with soybean aphids, and this is happening throughout the soybean belt, it's not specific to just one state, it's really throughout the United States uh, where soybeans are grown, but we're seeing uh, that IPM toolbox where we're really relying on one method for control and that's really being chemical control. Uh, I see where a lot of growers find a chemical that works and it works very well. And you always hear that idea, why fix what's not broken in it? For quite some time, this chemical is working very well. But we're beginning to see some failure in that that's beginning to establish and it's coming from the repeated use, not just season after season, but oftentimes making multiple applications within one season. Uh, and we're doing this without really switching to a new mode of action. So when you have this kind of rinse, uh, lather, repeat type of cycle, uh, those genetics, when you're turnovering uh, populations that quickly, begin to come into play. So really it's kind of looking like this. Uh, as we come into that first initial population, thinking about economic threshold, as you'll see in a moment, it's about 250 aphids per plant. Uh, we come in and spray with the chemical. And as you can see here, uh, we have about 20% survival uh, of aphids taking place from the spraying application. We've knocked out a large chunk, but when we've left any behind, uh, we just leave a little bit of that grounds for those rebuilding to begin. And we could get three, four weeks out and be looking at this again. So we have to come through for a second application. Uh, this time, uh, you're seeing a little bit stronger population base with resistant individuals. So we're at 20% earlier. Uh, you could be looking 30, 40, 50% uh, resistant individuals now. Uh, again, if conditions are right, we can see that boom in that population occur all over again, leading to a possible third time. So this kind of emphasizes why scouting regularly for soybean aphids is important. But now you can see, now it's 20% that are really being uh, controlled by chemical application. So this is just one of the ideas impacting much of the soybean growing regions of the United States. Uh, and North Dakota is no exception. Uh, we're seeing this in parts of North Dakota. So uh, one of the objectives over the last few years has been to determine the level of pyrethroid insecticide resistance across the state especially when it comes to controlling soybean aphids. Uh, by no means is soybean aphids the only insect or arthropod dealing with this. Spider mites is another one comes to mind, uh, but one of these that uh, a lot of researchers taking notice of. Uh, from 2017, uh, these are counties where pyrethroid failure was being observed, uh, as noted by grower reports, into respective uh, extension offices. Uh, you'll see here uh, southern parts of Minnesota, even a county uh, around that uh, Sioux Falls area, and it kind of picks up steam in that Red River Valley, both on the Minnesota side and on the North Dakota side, uh, impacting about nine counties or so in that region. So in 2017, uh, we began a, or at least uh, several universities began testing different populations to see what was happening. Uh, in North Dakota, six different counties uh, were initially reported with pyrethroid control problems in eastern North Dakota. Uh, so extension personnel went out to many of these counties collecting 
uh, leaves with the population. Uh, you'll see kind of in this lower corner down here, some of the petri dishes with some of the trifoliates there. Those trifoliates are actually covered in soybean aphid populations uh, that they're able to use in this study. Once we're able to come back into the uh, lab, uh, Dr. Jan Canodal kind of headed off this for NDSU. Uh, we were able to do a bioassay. So of course, we had our little vials here. We placed 10 wingless adult aphids inside each of these vials. Uh, and then we were testing two of the pyrethroids showing failure across the area. So lambda cyhalothrin and bifenthrin are two of those that were showing failure. Uh, three replications were used for each of the insecticide concentrations. Uh, we used an acetone control, and then we looked to an LC99 a, uh, level for spray, so 99% mortality from that lethal concentration. We also used a 2x uh, LC99 to go ahead and look at this, and we have made observations after 4 and 24 hours. Uh, for the purposes of today, I'm going to show you the 4 hours because it tells a pretty uh, good story here. Of course, you'll have mortality on the x-axis here. Uh, so 1.0 is going to be 100%. Uh, 0 0.6 is about 60% mortality. The yellow bar here is a laboratory colony. Uh, some of these colonies are years old. Uh, they've really not been exposed to any chemicals. Uh, to tell you how long some of these colonies can go, when I started uh, my master's degree back in 2009, I inherited a colony that was started in 2007 and that colony continues today. So we are able to continue this colony going without really having chemicals impacted uh, into those colonies. On the x-axis now, you'll see some of the areas where populations were collected. So I see Amarado there, I see Castleton. Uh, as you can see, uh, Hensel, North Dakota, you're still seeing pretty strong control there, almost 100%, kind of matching that of what we're seeing from that laboratory. Um, but as you look for lambda cyhalothrin at the four hour mark, you're seeing some failure beginning to occur out in Grafton. Uh, you're looking about 75, 80% control there. But in Asnabrock, uh, you're under 10% control being evaluated at that location. Next, we can come over to bifenthrin, and you're going to see pretty similar uh, results, or at least ideas being shown here. So the laboratory colony near 100% control, but as we move down, I see by Hope, North Dakota, about 30% uh, control being uh, observed in that location. Asenbrock is a little bit less. Uh, you'll see there's two locations being evaluated out of the Hensel area. Uh, one of those populations really showing those populations to be susceptible, about 95% control, if not a little more. But that second population, uh, about 5% control is being evaluated or observed in that location. So I just wanted to give you kind of a map where some of these populations have come from. So you're seeing uh, those six counties that were highlighted there. And we'll first start off, first that black dot looking up in Pemina County. Uh, that was a, a population that was collected where no resistance was being found. In fact, those chemicals were controlling those populations fairly well. Uh, if not close to 100%, it'd be a little under. Uh, as you go a little bit further south, uh, kind of that Fargo area and going a little north along that Red River, you're seeing those green triangles, indication of bifenthrin uh, problems being observed in those areas. Uh, getting up to the Walsh County area, land to Hylothrin, you're seeing some of that failure occurring there. And then in Calvillier and in Pemina County, again, some other populations really showing failure of both insecticides uh, at that location. Okay. So the idea was to continue this into 2018, but weather, when it comes to insects, can have a major impact. Uh, aphids like really hot, dry uh, areas, especially with human, but the weather conditions were just not conducive really to, uh, along with other environmental conditions, they weren't conducive to aphid populations in 2018, so aphid populations were really low. Uh, I talked about having the laboratory colony, so some of these populations from 2017 were held over in a laboratory uh, conditions uh, for the next year. Uh, and they wanted to kind of go through it again. What is taking place? And I'll show you those results here in a, a little bit. But essentially, some of those callings are beginning to show susceptibility again to both of those insecticides, so a little bit more control. And you'll see that here in a moment. And what that really suggests is populations are not overwintering here very well. 
uh, whether these resistant populations are being blown in from those Midwest regions. Uh, the idea again, try this out in 2019, uh, but really wet conditions throughout the state really prevented populations from really taking hold. So didn't really have many populations being found during the 2019 season. But what did that data from 2018 look like that I talked about? So I'll first jump over to the mortality axis here. Uh, you see 0.98, so of course at the bottom, 98% mortality up to 100. Uh, that laboratory, about 100% control. You're gonna see that um, with the bifenthrin, about 99.5% control, so still fairly good control taking place there, no significant differences there. Uh, the population from Emirato that survived the winter uh, in that colony uh, is showing pretty good susceptibility. So again, this is kind of yielding or suggesting this idea that they're not surviving the winter here. Uh, aphids are probably being blown in, containing some of that resistance that are there. So we always want to think about the IPM approach to this. So we now know resistance is in parts of eastern North Dakota. And as soybeans become more popular to the west, uh, as environmental conditions warrant, uh, it won't surprise me to begin to see soybean aphids populations begin to show up here and there. A couple years ago, uh, probably during that 2017 season, we did find them as far west as the Drake, North Dakota area, uh, and also in the rugby area. And in that rugby area, they did make economic threshold. So the important thing is be able to recognize what soybean aphids look like and use the labeled products and the rates as suggested by that label if you come across economic thresholds. Again, scout fields regularly. Uh, this is gonna be important to keep track of uh, where these populations are. We talked about that day and a half turnover in a generation. So this could be important just to make sure you're doing it regularly, uh, especially in the late vegetative into the reproductive stages. Use economic threshold as, your as the aid in decision-making of, do I really need to make an insecticide application? Uh, the main reason for this is you should be scouting for your beneficial insects as well. I said earlier that economic threshold is 250 aphids per plant. If I take an immature, the larva of a ladybug, a lady beetle, we have recognized in laboratory conditions and in some small plots that the immature can feed 200 aphids per day. So 200 aphids per day being eaten by one larva of a ladybug, 250 economic threshold, you can see the impact that that could have in maybe holding off or preventing an insecticide application. Uh, if you make that spray, uh, the aphids will probably start rebuilding quicker and you're probably gonna lose a lot, a big chunk of your uh, beneficial insects. And as I said earlier, rotating your mode of action is gonna be really important. Uh, 250 aphids per plant is that economic threshold. Uh, 670 is where that economic injury level is really going to hold out. So 670 aphids per plant, really yielding those numbers to about the R6 stage. Once you get to that R7 stage, R8 stage, of course, we've reached full maturity. So any feeding by aphids during that time really is not going to have impact on your yield uh, as the seed has really been developed already by that time. Okay. So what are some of those other modes of action as we get away from maybe bifenthrin, uh, some of those other pyrethroids? So uh, we have uh, some of those carbamates, uh, that's a possibility, uh, linate uh, as one of those possibilities. Uh, neonicotinoids like imidacloprin, uh, Wrangler, Nupred are some of those possible examples. Some organophosphates are in the area. So uh, kind of keeping this list in mind and being able to rotate, especially during a single growing season, if multiple applications need to be made. Of course, think about other members or tools in that IPM toolbox. So we talked about biological control. Uh, ladybugs, lacewings are gonna be very big. Uh, there are some varieties of soybean with host plant resistance in the area. Uh, the rag genes uh, have been become more popular in the last decade or so, uh, holding back development of some of the aphids or just deterring the aphid from wanting to feed on that plant. I do want to thank the North Dakota Serbian Council for helping fund that project along with some of the colleagues at the University of Minnesota. Uh, next, I want to turn over to the soybean gall midge. And uh, this is a new pest getting closer to the area. It's not been found in North Dakota yet, uh, but it's coming closer and closer to North Dakota. It's not too far away. 
Uh, I do want to point out uh, one of my co-authors, uh, Dr. Justin McMechan at the University of Nebraska. That name may sound familiar to some of you in the north central part of the state. Uh, he kind of grew up just north of Mohal, but he's kind of been leading the research efforts uh, in this uh, particular insect since its arrival. Uh, this is a brand new pest. It's really only been around since about uh, 2018, 2017, when some of those initial reports began to come in. It was officially described uh, by Dr. Zagagne and Yukawa uh, 2019. Uh, as I said earlier, this is not found in North Dakota. Uh, one of the interesting things is what does the specimen look like? So I see the red, or pardon me, the light and black banding. Uh, this is up on the legs uh, listed there. Uh, you can see that banding also taking presence on the uh, wings as well. This is kind of the area in the last couple of years where this has been identified. So we're up to five states, 92 counties in the area. Uh, those in red were found in 2018 and those in orange were found to be identified in the 2019 growing season. Uh, so you can see uh, there's that north border of South Dakota, uh, North Dakota right up north to it, uh, Emmons County in South Dakota. It's getting pretty close in this area and it's continuing to expand uh, throughout the region. Um, especially in that uh, kind of Nebraska, Iowa uh, territory, but it's beginning to move a little bit further north and south along that Missouri River Valley. So last year with some of our IPM surveys, they began to scout for this in parts of North Dakota. So really uh, some of the scouting taking place from full bloom into maturity, evaluating more than 100 plants per field. Uh, 78 locations across 11 counties were completed. The nice thing about what we found in 2019 is everything was negative. It was not detected a year ago. Uh, this work will continue looking forward into 20, uh, 2020. Uh, so we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed that we'll continue to have that negative detection, but we'll have to see uh, where it falls into place. When I think about this insect, it's not the adult that is the issue, it's really the immature part of this life cycle. So here you can see two parts of the immature. So this is the really young immature at the top there. It's a little bit translucent. Uh, the older it gets, it begins to take an orangish red coloration. Uh, it'll get about to be a quarter of an inch long at max. Uh, like that. Uh, you can see some of these uh, on the base of the soybean stems beginning to appear uh, in some of these photos here. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more red orange as we said earlier the black and white on the adults. Uh, one thing they detected they were just beginning to learn about two to three generations per year the further south you go. So uh, here to the north it's probably going to be more about two generations per year uh, just because of the shorter growing season. Uh, as I said, uh, the larvae stage is really going to be part of that complete uh, metamorphosis life cycle. So think of a butterfly, you know, egg, caterpillar, caterpillar, uh, uh, pupa, cocoon, and adult. It's going to be that larva or the caterpillar stage, if you will, that leads to the damage. Uh, evaluations coming out of the south are showing overwintering is probably occurring through the larva cocoon stage in the soil, similar to a relative that we do experience here in North Dakota, and that's going to be that of wheat midge. Uh, a lot of us have dealt with wheat midge and small grain, so this is a very close relative of that species. Uh, in 2019, uh, the first adult emergence in the south was in about mid-June, uh, working towards the early part of July. As we came further north, parts of Minnesota were really the early part of July, around that 4th of July holiday. Uh, larvae began to be observed in soybean stems uh, in Minnesota really the end of June and into the month of July. Uh, one of the interesting questions not well understood yet is how is the larvae getting into the stem? Uh, some ideas being tossed around maybe naturally occurring cracks uh, in the lower part of the stem or maybe it's coming from some other form of wound. Uh, maybe something like hail injury uh, could be leading to the infection and that's something that's still being observed and evaluated in different regions of the uh, soybean belt. Uh, when soybeans become very severe, it is possible for the plant to begin to wilt uh, and even die in severe uh, populations. One of the big things to take note of is the black stem at the soil base. This is going to kind of be that initial factor that infection may be possible. So you'll kind of take your fingernail to break that epidermis open to peel open the inside of that stem to make some observations. 
Um, for this particular specimen, the area of the field most prone to damage is going to be that area near the field edge, especially along edges where soybeans was grown in the field next door the year before. So thinking about uh, where that overwintering is occurring and it's going to attack that first crop that's closest to it for that soybean. So uh, you can see some of the most severe damage occurring by that field edge and it gets less noticeable the further into the field you go. Uh, this kind of just painting a similar picture, uh, small dead plants, reduced pods can translate to 20 to 100% uh, yield loss on field edges. Uh, looking at some information from the University of Nebraska, we're getting 50 feet into the field and still seeing zero bushels per acre from some of those crops. So this can have a pretty severe impact. As we get uh, 100, 200, 400 feet in the uh, field, you begin to see a less impact, about 40 bushels per acre, uh, 400 feet into that field. So scout early uh, and scout often uh, beginning in mid-June and really concentrate on those field edges. We're really going to know where that's going to show up should it appear. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, the best way to do that is just peel back the stem of the epidermis with your fingernail to expose the larva if they are present in that particular area. Again, picking those plants that have that blackened base of the stem. Another close relative to this is the white mold gall midge and it has a very similar wide cycle, uh, life cycle, pardon me. Um, the one thing with it, it is found here in North Dakota in the last few years and it is very similar in appearance to that of the soybean gall midge. So I just wanted to bring you a few photos of this. Uh, as you can see, uh, some southeastern counties, uh, Richland County, Barnes County, Lemoore County, had some detections between 2018 and 2019, along with other areas not shown here, like parts of uh, Manitoba and Wisconsin. So uh, it is being found in some parts of the uh, region. So this is one thing we'll have to keep on a lookout for as we move into 2020. How does it differ from the soybean gall midge? So here, we're gonna have the soybean gall midge, the one that's not here in North Dakota yet, uh, compared to that of the white mold gall midge, okay? So when does it arrive? So we said earlier with the soybean gall midge, third leaf stage, and may perhaps the rest of the growing season. Uh, when you think about the white mold ridge, it's really going to depend on if stem rot and white mold is appearing on that plant. So after flowering and after the onset of uh, white mold on that plant. Locations in the field, uh, the white mold uh, midge really where stem rot, white mold is being present uh, throughout that area. And where is it found on the plant? Right where that uh, mold is being found. So here you see an example, uh, parts of the pod here and some of those specimen, the larvae that's attacking that plant. Uh, again, for the sorbian gall midge, getting back to those field edges and really being at the base of that plant. So you're seeing differences uh, where the uh, specimen is attacking that soybean plant. Uh, coloration is pretty similar to be honest with you. It's a little bit more intense for the soybean gall midge compared to that of the uh, white mold midge. So again, it's really gonna be looking at what part of the plant is it on and is white mold present uh, to be one of the key factors there. Differences for the adults, as you can see, it looks very similar to wheat midge uh, between these two pretty closely related. Again, legs and wings are going to be kind of that black and light colored uh, banding on the soybean gall midge. The white uh, mold midge uniformly gray for both the legs and the wings. Okay. The last thing I wanted to turn my attention to is uh, some of the feeding caterpillars. So we're just going to spend a couple of minutes on this. Uh, 2019, caterpillars were pretty hit and miss across the north central, the northwest and parts of the western part of the state. Uh, I took a couple calls in regarding the thistle caterpillar and that of the green clover worm. Uh, in all the calls that I took, neither of these had reached economic threshold. They were just under observation in some of our locations. Uh, but these, uh, the alfalfa webworm, soybean looper, velvet bean, caterpillar, some of those found in other parts of the state of North Dakota, really more in the eastern part of the state. Uh, the life cycle, um, thinking about that of our, the common butterflies, okay? So we have the egg, some of our caterpillar, so in star one, really small, gets a little bigger in star two, in star three, just a little bit bigger before moving into the cocoon and then the adult stage. It'll be right here in the larva stage where most of the damage, if not all the damage is going to occur. Of course, no feeding occurs here. 
and this will actually turn away from defoliating in the adult stage. So it'll really be the caterpillars that will be attacking the plants. So just thinking about a scouting is going to be very important again, especially as you get closer to the uh, flowering stages and the stages where pods are being put on the plant. So scout from the late vegetative into the R6 stage. Uh, walk 10 rows into the field before starting and make a W-like pattern. Uh, visiting four or five locations throughout the field. Remove the top trifoliate, a trifoliate from the middle and one from the lower part of the leaf at each of those locations uh, for those 10 plants and kind of keep them together as you move through the field. Okay. Uh, once you're done uh, visiting all four or five of those locations in the field, you can kind of come back to the truck. And on each of those trifoliates, you're going to evaluate the damage occurring, okay? So the leaf with the most defoliation, you can pull off and throw away. The one with the lowest, you can pull off and throw away. The goal is to take an average and have kind of that moderate to give a better understanding of what's happening in the field. So you'll retain the moderate damage defoliation leaf. And then taking all those leaves together, you're going to calculate an average of damage that's there. Uh, so you can see some of the average percentages being listed here. Uh, if you're at 30% damage in the vegetative stages, this will warrant economic threshold and a possible chemical application. Once you get into the uh, reproductive stages, it actually comes to 20% damage. Of course, um, as plants reach flowering and pod filling, that's going to be where defoliation can cause the greater risk for yield loss. So 20% defoliation for reproductive, 30% in vegetative. However, make sure that the damage occurring there is actually from caterpillars. Other insects such as grasshoppers and bean leaf beetle can lead to similar damage. Okay. Also think about natural control that could be occurring. Again, scout for the beneficial insects. So parasitic wasp and other predators in a field can help kill off some of the caterpillars. Uh, high temperatures or warm temperatures, high humidity can lead to viral disease, fungus development that can also kill off uh, some of the caterpillars at a field site. So think about some of the other types of control that could be in that area. If economic threshold is found, uh, here are some of the uh, insecticide recommendations that could be followed. Again, if multiple have to, uh, applications have to be used, try switching up the uh, classes, the modes of action to help extend or prolong some of the life cycles of our chemicals that are there. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the insect update I have for everyone today.